welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Victoria. My name is Alastair Roth. I'm Executive Director of AWI Vic, and uh, thank you all for joining us. We've covered Russia's war in Ukraine from several different angles over the last several months, but thought it'd be interesting to view a different perspective and perhaps an unintended consequence the proliferation of oil shipments evading sanctions. So to discuss Shifty Shades of Grey, the dark fleet shipping sanctioned oil around the world, we're joined from London by Michelle V.C. Bachman. Uh, Michelle's a senior analyst at Lloyd's List Intelligence and shipping market editor at Lloyd's List. For those who don't know, Lloyd's List is the preeminent publication for the shipping industry. In fact, it's one of the world's oldest continuously running journals. They've been providing shipping news in London since the early 1700s. And Michelle's an Aussie. Before moving to England, she was a political writer for The Australian, amongst other publications, did her degree in journalism at the University of South Australia. So I think it's very fitting that the AWIA should host an industry expert on such an interesting topic. Um, Michelle, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us uh, in your morning. And I'll hand over to you to see you at the Q&A. OK, thank you. Good morning. Good evening, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen so I can begin my presentation. So I'll be talking about the shadow fleet or dark fleet of tankers, a rather vague term that's used to describe hundreds of tankers shipping Venezuelan, Iranian, and Russian oil. Now, this presentation is going to define what a dark tanker is, identify fleet characteristics, business models used, and track the unprecedented impact this is having on oil and shipping markets. I'll share the names of the top 10 operators and ship managers I've identified in Russian trades, where they are linked, and illustrate how these anonymous owners are structuring their operations to profit from this high risk, high reward market. Firstly, though, I have to remind the audience and make it explicitly clear that even if the vessels are part of the shadow fleet, this doesn't necessarily mean that they are in breach of any sanctions. And that refers back to my, my shifty shades of grey, which will come later in the presentation. So here's my methodology. Um, firstly, to qualify to be part of the dark fleet, a tanker has to be aged 15 years or over. Many oil company charter policies exclude ships over this age, so this provides a ready-made market for vintage ships. Tankers must be anonymously owned and or have an ownership structure designed to obfuscate beneficial owner discovery. Now, this is typical for shipping, but the structures used by the dark fleet are unusually Byzantine for the industry. And they must be solely deployed in sanctioned trades. Now, most tankers work in what we call spot trades, calling at a number of countries, say Saudi Arabia one voyage, maybe West Africa the next. The dark fleet trading patterns are inefficient and very unusual. And then finally, the tanker must be engaged in one or more of the deceptive shipping practices outlined in the US government's guidance issued in May 2020. And that includes practices such as flag hopping and that switching from flag register to register to register to ship to ship transfers of oil cargoes in international waters, um, plus other characteristics such as very opaque and frequent changes to ownership and management structures and switching off their automatic identification systems, which are the transponders on board vessels to um, for vessel tracking and, and by switching it off you can't see where the tanker's going. Excluded are government controlled tankers such as Russia's Sovkonflok or Iran's National Iranian Tanker Company and those already sanctioned. So here is the dark fleet map as of June 15. This comprised of 485 tankers of some 72 million dead weight tons with an average age of 23 years. It's equivalent to 12% of the internationally trading fleet by dead weight. And by way of context, there are about 5,000 tankers globally shipping about 50 million barrels per day of crude, which is about half the world demand. And all up, 
about four to five million barrels per day is being shipped through some of the busiest waterways. And you can see on this slide, a lot of it is going to China, um, which is the, the biggest buyer. In fact, sanctioned oil from Russia, Iran, and Venezuela accounted for about 20% of all of China's imports in analysis I conducted earlier this year. So here's a breakdown, uh, a further breakdown of key facts and figures. Nearly two thirds of tankers do not have protection and indemnity insurance from the 12 clubs that form the international group and cover 95% of the world's tankers. So why is this significant? These clubs provide the equivalent of comprehensive insurance for a car. So if there's an accident or an oil spill, you know that someone will pay for the cleanup. So the PI business is concentrated in the hands of 12 clubs, mostly based in Europe or the UK, and their risk is reinsured in the Lloyds market here in London. So the absence of known insurance coverage is again equivalent to the risk of really old uninsured cars with unlicensed drivers driving around the, you know, the roads of inner Melbourne, for example. Uh, the classification society is unknown for about 18% of the fleet. And the role of classification societies is to ensure that ships comply with technical standards and undertake surveys and inspections. And this is particularly important as a ship ages. Now, about 150 tankers are tracked directly working in Russian trades, and they comprise 31% of all calls at Russian Baltic and Black Sea ports over May. Um, Greek owned tankers shipped about half of all crude, fuel oil, and refined products loaded there under oil price cap arrangements. The oil price cap was introduced by the G7 and Australia on December 5 for crude and February 5 for refined products, and it sits alongside bans on Russian imports. And this has particularly affected Europe and the UK, which were the biggest receivers of diesel and crude. So this cap prevents Western ship owners, charterers, oil traders, banks, insurers from shipping Russian oil to third countries unless they can prove it was sold at or below $60 per barrel. So why is it relevant that Greek ship owners have such a large share of the market? Greece is the biggest nation of ship owners. And while most Western owners have moved away from the market because of reputational risk, these mostly private Greek owned companies have moved in. Pre-invasion, they had about 31% of the share, and now they have around half. Now, Ural's crude, which is loaded at ports in the Baltic and Black Sea, until two days ago, was priced below the cap. It's a different story on Russia's Pacific coast, where unlike Ural's crude, the grades there are priced above the $60 per barrel cap. So dark fleet insurers, so, sorry, dark fleet tankers without insurance from Western providers plus those owned by Russia's Sovkom flop shipped nearly all but a, a handful of cargoes that I tracked loading from Pacific ports in May. While the Ural's crude is priced lower than the price cap, um, which it has done until uh, since December until now, the effectiveness of the G7 oil price cap remains untested. So watch this space. Uh, the role of the dark fleet will become more important if Greek ship owners are squeezed out of Baltic and Black Sea ports. So this is the shadow fleet by, by vessel type and their percentage of the global fleet. Um, Suez Maxes and Afro Maxes are favored for their versatility, especially in Russian trades. And there are 117 very large crude carriers favored for their storage capabilities. Now I'm just going to give you some reference for that uh, vessel type. Very large crude carriers hold about 2 million barrels of oil. Suez Maxes, about 1 million barrels of oil. Afro Maxes, about 600,000 barrels. And LR1s, the same size. And medium range tankers or MRs, about 300,000 tons. So I just wanted to go through that. that. Uh, China bound Russian oil is frequently consolidated onto those larger, very large crude carriers from smaller Afro Max cargoes via ship-to-ship -ship transfers in international waters, and then they sail around the Cape of Good Hope to Asia. And smaller medium range tankers are used for Russian diesel and other refined product cargoes 
often via ship to ship transfers off Kalamar to Greece, again in international waters where they don't come under the, the scrutiny of port authorities. Um, they effectively operate as a shuttle service from Russian ports, and this is all part of the, the dark fleet logistics chain. It's important to note that the risk profile of these ships can vary, and there are shades of grey. There are tankers with Western insurance, lifting oil price cap compliant Russian crude, the lighter shade, which I'll expand on shortly. But then you get a whole host of, of bad actors, falsely flagged ships, fraudulently issued company numbers, and company numbers are uh, part of the International Maritime Organization's company numbering scheme. And that UN agency issues that number over for a vessel over the, the vessel's life, and it remains unchanged no matter how many different owners or, or names it has. And this scheme's being abused. Also being abused are blue cards. They're issued by the clubs. Um, on behalf of the, oh, sorry, they're issued on by a flag registry on behalf of the, the clubs. And they're like proof of insurance that something like a, a vessel would show to a port official if requested. Um, some of these clubs don't exist. There are, there's one insurance company that my favorite, the East of, Eng East of England Association. And I tracked that to a GoDaddy website in Bulgaria a few years back. And despite this, the company remains recognized by some flag registries to this day. Needless to say, the exploitation of these regulatory gaps is undermining the integrity of in global trade. Here is the fleet composition by flag registry. Smaller flags with little technical expertise or regulatory oversight are, regulatory, are regularly targeted. Um, now I should explain that for tax reasons, a ship owner based in Europe or Asia, for example, won't, won't flag the vessel where they are based. The easiest way to explain a registry is that it's, it's flying the flag of a country is a little bit like a ship's passport, except it can be changed as often as they like. But what's happened here with the Dark Fleet is that a lot of countries from small Pacific islands and African countries in particular have worked out that this is a quite a nice little earner and they've hired private consultancies to run the registry on their behalf and with little regulatory oversight for their services. And effectively they're offering these anonymous owners and their elderly ships a, a safe haven from normal rules. So Cameroon, for example, flags 32 tankers, including 12 of the, the largest, their VLCCs, and Gabon nearly 46. Now you'll note here that Panama, the world's largest flag registry, is disproportionately represented with 47% of the dark fleet by deadweight. Um, normally they account for about 16% globally. And very few are flagged with the higher quality US incorporated registries of Marshall Islands and Liberia, which are the world's second and third largest flags. So when you look at the registered owner by country, it can get interesting. The Marshall Islands flags only 2% of the dark fleet, yet 39% of the single ship registered ownership companies are incorporated there. Now this is a hallmark of the business model for tankers in Russian trades. The registered owner is frequently incorporated in the Marshall Islands yet flagged elsewhere. Now, the single ship shell company structure is normal in shipping to reduce liability, but what you would typically see is the registered owner being formed in the Marshall Islands, for example, and then flagged there too. So this structure is just adding additional layers of obfuscation to an already complex ownership structure that's seen in international shipping. Now, the ISM or International, Sa international Safety Management Manager is frequently based in India, the United Arab Emirates, China, or Hong Kong. And these four countries comprise 60% of ship managers or commercial operators. Now an ISM manager is responsible for ensuring the ship adheres to international safety and management codes. It can be in-house or a third party company, but the dark fleet is mostly traced to these anonymous shell-like ISM companies. And some of these I've tracked to addresses at near empty shopping malls in Mumbai, or even above a carpet shop in Dubai. 
And you'll also see obscure countries like Moldova, the Seychelles, Curacao, Belize, et cetera, being used as the, the base for these companies. And how that plays out will be shown in my top 10 list later. So how has this affected global oil trades? So seven months on, the West ban on Russian oil has resulted in an unprecedented recalibration and redrawing of global crude and diesel trades, yielding bizarre arbitrages and never before seen routes. India is now the largest importer of Russian crude, taking 20 times more than it did pre-invasion. And deeply discounted Russian diesel, once destined for Europe, is now heading for Turkey, Brazil, Northern Africa, and bizarrely, the Middle East. And I say bizarrely because, for example, Saudi Arabia, whose refineries already produce twice the amount of diesel and gas oil than the country requires, is actually importing diesel from Russia for domestic use. And then Saudi refineries are exporting their own middle distillates to Europe and Singapore. And I've also seen some small tankers loaded with refined, pro refined products at the Baltic Russian ports sailing direct to Manaus in Brazil. So this shift from west to east and the consequent increase in tonne miles has underpinned a recovery in freight rates for the tanker sector. And that meant that the global fleet of some 5,000 ships recorded billions in profits over the past five quarters. So not only are there longer sailing distances, but the dark fleet, as I mentioned earlier, is very inefficient. Tankers spend much time in ship-to-ship -ship transfer zones, which deliberately take place in international waters outside the scrutiny of port authorities. And I've, located, I've listed the locations here on the slide, um, Sweater near Gibraltar, particularly a cluster of Southeast Malaysia, West Africa, Kalamata I referenced before, and also, in the mid-Atlantic. So cargoes can be carried on as many as four or five tankers before eventual discharge at port. False bills of lading are frequent. Malaysian blend is transferred from the tankers you see of Southeast Malaysia, and that's a common term for, for Iranian crude. And for a second consecutive summer, VLCCs are undertaking ship to ship transfers hundreds of nautical miles off Europe's coast in the middle of the Atlantic. And this practice is widely condemned as unsafe. So here are the known spoofing spots for Iran, Venezuelan and Russian dark fleet tankers. And that's the, that term refers to the manipulation of the ship's AIS to appear to be in one, one location while actually being in another. Off West Africa, for example, there are around 20 tankers, mainly very large crew carriers that claim to be at anchor off Angola, but as shown here, but they're actually busy loading in Venezuela. Um, recently, we've uncovered tankers spoofing their location in the Sea of Japan while at the Pacific Russian port of Cosmino, something that the US Office of Foreign Asset Control warned about in April. As it turns out, one of them had lease financing arrangements by the hedge fund KKR to a Greek owner. So now to the different shades, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen briefly. Um, so we have the lighter shade of gray. Um, these, um, the example that I would give were, would be product tankers that were purchased by an anonymous owner between November, 2022 and February, 2023 for immediate deployment in Russian trades. Each tanker would list a single ship Brass Islands Incorporated registered owner, and then regular, begin to regularly call at Russian Baltic ports, and then undertake ship to ship transfers off Kalamata, Greece. So you wouldn't necessarily know if these transfers are compliant with the oil price cap, but it does trigger a warning under our guidance because ship to ship transfers are mentioned under the US guidance. And so that therefore they come under the methodology. Um, another example would be plain gray. Um, for example, a Djibouti flagged VLCC that would have Western insurance via its registered owner, say in the Seychelles, and managed from maybe Belize, 
Now, how can a tanker bank that's part of the dark fleet have Western insurance? As I said, a third of these uh, insured, that's because they may be offering oil price cap compliant cargoes. But in some cases, the marine insurers believe that these vessels are, are not doing anything wrong or illegal and are fully compliant with their own policies. Dark grey, um, perhaps tankers flagged with a high risk open registry, and they may be also have lower levels of technical and safety management oversight. So flags that are on the so-called black or grey list of the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, which is a compilation of vessels detained at ports in various areas, include Cameroon, Togo, Comoros, Tanzania, Belize, Sierra Leone, Cook Islands, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Palau. And they have often frequent unexplained gaps in their AIS signals, a history of flag hopping, and no known insurance. And they may be operating in Russian, Venezuelan, Iranian oil trades, or both. Um, you can have various shades of risk identified in a single fleet. Um, I identified one company with six vessels based in Hong Kong. Their fleet had an average age of 23 years, no contact or website details, and frequently changing uh, names, AIS irregularities, and undertaking ship-to-ship -ship transfers with other dark fleet companies. So now I'm going to reshare my screen and move to, oh, it, I did have those slides. I'm sorry, I didn't think they were there. I apologize. So now I'm going to move to my top 10 list for Russian trades. So I'll preface this by saying that every company mentioned in this presentation, I've attempted to contact, offering them an opportunity to comment on my findings. These people don't want to be found, so it wasn't easy. And I should also mention that this was current as of late June. Um, out of the dozens of companies, two responded, and most flag registries politely have told me to take my questions elsewhere. I've had some futile WhatsApp messages from the head of Gabon's Maritime Authority too, before he went silent. So it is really difficult to, to compile this information. So anonymous owners are placing their vessels with newly created ship managers and commercial managers, <clears throat> excuse me, based in either India or the United Arab Emirates. Um, the best known one is, <clears throat> excuse me, Gatic Ship Management, which amassed a 50 plus fleet of tankers worth 1.5 billion in 18 months. And it's really the dark fleet's poster child until about 10 weeks ago. Gatic tankers were deflagged by the UK incorporated St. Kitts and Nevis registry, dumped by their insurer, American Club, and kicked out of Lloyd's Register Classification Society for breaching Western sanctions. Since then, its fleet has contracted to five tankers, according to shipping databases, with all but a handful transferring to at least nine different India-based ship managers over the past five months. And that's come amid intensifying public attention on Gatic, its related commercial operator, Buena Vista Shipping, and its mystery backers. Um, replacement ship managers share Gatic's characteristics in that they were all formed in 22, 2023, exclusively to manage or operate dark fleet tankers bought post invasion, mostly from European and or American owners. So nearly all the names on this list emerged last year, and they underpinned a buying binge for vintage tanker tonnage that saw asset prices leap threefold and culminated in the sale of more than 100 tankers ahead of the EU import bans and G7 sanctions. So most of these fleets were in place ahead of the implementation of the G7's oil price cap. And as you can see, these anonymous owners and buyers used a variety of shell companies and intermediary, intermediaries to either obfuscate the know your customer and due diligence checks, or provide a handy layer of corporate plausible deniability. 
the ever-moving, ever-changing structures make it difficult for accurate and complete database monitoring. Commercial operator Buena Vista Shipping, for example, is based in the same Mumbai shopping mall as Girik and Gatik Ship Management, and it remains listed as the beneficial owner of 37 tankers, formerly with Gatik, according to shipping databases. Um, at the same time, and what I believe was a regulatory FU to the maritime world, seven Gatic tankers were reflagged to Mongolia, the world's worst performing flag. This model's replicated across the dark fleet with special purpose ship managers or commercial operators, most, mostly in India and the UAE. So number two, Wanta Shipping has links to Dubai-based commercial operator Koban Shipping, although this is contested, and through Koban Shipping to a host of other ISM managers and companies in Hong Kong. So for example, Hong Kong-based ship management services you see there was an interim ISM manager for a matter of days or weeks for nine tankers that ended up being technically managed by Wanta Shipping while Macario shipping managed 11 tankers just from October through to April, highly unusual. All of the tankers were insured with two, uh, this is from Wanta, were insured with two different international group P&I clubs. And that indicates that the Russian oil that they are shipping is compliant with the oil price cap. So number three, radi radiating world shipping services flags exclusively in the Cook Islands which was a former registry of choice for shipping Iranian oil. And Hennessy Tankers, a commercial operator best identified by tankers that have the prefix HS in their name, their single ship registered owner in the Marshall Islands all has their companies named via the HS prefix as well. Um, Maritus Fleet Private Limited man manages most of Hennessy ships, and it's also connected to Bravo Ship Management, and IMMS Middle East. Um, IMMS Middle East was the intermediary buyer of some of these tankers and owned them for a matter of days. None of the Hennessy tankers are insured with international group clubs. It has a GoDaddy website launched last August that says it's quote unquote coming soon. Number seven, KNO Ship Management is the youngest with five Suez Maxes and three Afro Maxes. And these are all commercially operated out of Hong Kong with separate companies with the prefix East linked to brass plate addresses. And number 10 is a mystery Chinese fleet of 20 tankers, all with no discernible links, except they are all involved in ship to ship transfers of Russian cargoes in the mid-Atlantic. They share a Hong Kong or China based ship manager with the same service addresses and similar company names. So this slide from the in India Register of Shipping shows the invoicing address for a Hennessy tanker back to a company in the UAE that I can't find listed anywhere. And the India Register is the classification society of choice, not only for Sovkin plot tankers, but Gatic tankers and Hennessy tankers. So here's how Hennessy tankers is reflected in shipping databases. You can see the multiple intermediaries upon sale in September before this ship ended up with Maritas and the Marshall Islands Incorporated single ship company for this tanker has an address care of a KG company allegedly in Hamburg that cannot be traced. So finally, where does this all end? Um, this is the Aframax tanker Pablo that exploded off Southeast Malaysia in April, killing three crew. The dark fleet is an accident waiting to happen. Pablo changed flags and class six days before the fatal accident. The recognized organization or class society or class was a shell company in Singapore called Foresight Shipping that has links to North Korea. Insurance was unknown. The flag was Gabon. And um, as I said earlier, I've had no luck getting any sense out of the UAE-based registry manager, nor the country's maritime authority. I've only got one small clue about who is behind Pablo by emailing the registered owner, 
by the address provided from the IMO website using an email tracker, and it was opened in the United Arab Emirates. So finishing off, let's not forget that the Dark Fleet serves a purpose, keeping Russian, Iranian, and Venezuela oil flowing, curtailing any inflationary-led surge in oil prices. And I don't believe that there will be action on the worst of these ships finding refuge in the regulatory crevices of the maritime world until there's a major environmental accident. So I'm stopping there and open for questions and have raced through. I'm sure that the audience would like to I'm, ask anything about uh, what I've explained. Well, I, Michelle, thank you very much. I, um, I, I was uh, listening earlier today be before the session to um, a Lloyd's List podcast and I, I saw you described there as the uncoverer in chief of deceptive and dodgy shipping practices. I can I can see the amount of sleuthing that must have to go into trying to peel away these these layers of 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 well the, the shades of grey I suppose as, as mm. you say. Um, so I've I've got a couple of questions just to to pitch in first. Well, actually, I've got a lot, but then I'll come back. So audience, to please feel free just to put any questions in the in the Q and A tab and go. Um, I'm I'm not sure where to start. I, mean, um, I, I was amazed at, at, at the ship to ship transfer you're talking about in the mid Atlantic. I mean the the risks involved in that must be horrendous. I mean how 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 is that coordinated from from larger ship to smaller ship? I suppose if if that's happening, um, is that is that you know other other middlemen or organisations involved in that or? Well, we assume not. Um, the most likely scenario is that the experts in undertaking ship to ship transfers are actually employed on the ship as crew and that this is undertaken because it does require a lot of specialist knowledge. But because usually the registry, the flag registry is one of these obscure countries under um, international maritime law, the vessel is under the laws and jurisdiction of that country. So if you're with Gabon, for example, you really don't give a toss if that's happening or not. So typically it's a very large crude carrier, which has 2 million barrels of crude that will go out in the middle Atlantic. It will take three cargoes more or less from an Aframax tanker that's loaded crude from Baltic ports of Primorsk or Asluga, and then we'll sail around the Cape of Good Hope to to yep. China, but a very dangerous practice. And at the International Maritime Organization, it's already been raised by their le legal committee. They would like to have further, no further notification, but as you can see, there are so many regulatory crevices, it's unlikely that that will stop. Yeah, there seem to be so many bodies involved in i mean I, I was trying to think earlier i mean who who is the regulator i mean there, there really is no single regulator i guess if, if you there's, there's there's classification societies and um the p and i the insurance side i mean banks involved um i mean do, does the does the un have any role um in in trying to um uh, shed light on on the transparency of ownership is, is the IMO a body that can deal with this for example or well the IMO I mean all of these all of these ships and their owners are exploiting gaps in IMO um, conventions and and laws because obviously you can pass a law but it's up to the the member state to enforce it which is why a lot of these practices are happening in international waters where they come under the jurisdiction of Djibouti or Gabon. I know that the US is pressuring flag states like Panama to be more compliant with a lot of the um, sanctions and to crack down on, on the dark fleet they, they flag. But th it, it's very difficult because these are countries that lack technical expertise and resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, port state control in terms of uh, technical deficiencies on a ship, uh, presumably that only happens if they're coming into national waters where they're going to be able to 
inspect and i mean have any of these been detained arrested for technical deficiencies uh yes and no so obviously the some some of these vessels actually never call it a port because yeah. of their central role in ship to ship transfers some will call it russia well of course russia is not going to add proper port states no. control scrutiny it's not in their interest and there has been recently um, intensifying pressure on China, the ultimate destination for most of these cargoes to crack down. What we have seen and reported on previously is when I talk about these blue cards, which are like proof of insurance. So there's actually a market in getting, buying effectively a piece of paper. So there's a, a, a P&I P club, I use that called Edinburgh based out of Shanghai. And you can go there, you can buy your blue card. And as long as you show that to the port authorities, they'll look the other way. Hmm. Recently, we have seen some of these older ships detained by China and talk of a, a crackdown. But as you can tell, there's such a huge volume coming into China. It's not really in their interest to, to shut off the supply of cheap crude. Hmm. Yeah, so where geopolitics, geopolitics yeah. is playing out in within the, these these maritime trades. Yes, and I mean the point the point you made about Saudi import, importing cheap diesel and then obviously re-exporting their own, mm -hmm. arbitraging the the price difference. I mean, yeah, a lot of a lot of people are obviously benefiting out of this. Um, and and I suppose I mean, it, do do navies have any role in enforcing? rules and you know can can they track any of these ships I, I guess if it's international waters again it's hands off is that right that that's true so the the main way to track these vessels is using um open source automatic identification signals mm -hmm. that the vessels have on their transponders now this is easily manipulated as i explained via spoofing pretending to be in one place when you're actually somewhere else and also just switching it off the alternative tracking me mechanism is called LRIT, that stands for Long Range International Tracking. Mm -hmm. Now, that is di more difficult to switch off, and that is owned by the flag states. Once again, if you're flagged somewhere like, let's say, Cameroon, you're not going to find Cameroon checking, and neither is it the role of the flag registry, to be checking the whereabouts of ev every single tanker or vessel that they flag so technical and and the impossibility of insurers or anybody in the a marine service provider to 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 check on what a vessel is doing mm. yeah um i'm just just running through a few questions here from online um we got a question from john Schilling. how the the price cap you mentioned of of the sixty dollars how how is that verified with respect to individual transactions or or shipments? So the the different the EU the UK and the US have all put out a series of guidelines and they call it in the form of an attestation. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, 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 a an oil trader or you're in the position to know the price of the cargo, you have to have evidence that this has been sold at or below um, the price cap. For a ship owner, where you wouldn't sometimes necessarily know the, the price, you have to make sure that you've verified that there is attestation on board. And with the US, for example, they provide safe harbor protection. So they'll say, well, if, if you've done as much as possible mm -hmm. in order to verify that, that that cargo is price cap compliant, then we will offer you protection. So how it's working in 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 or how it's working and in place now we haven't had anybody busted for shipping non oil price cap compliance by any of those governments so there's no official known tests out there we have had ships that we believe have been shipping non oil price cap compliant um crude or cargoes and that's because their western insurance has been removed and i used the example earlier of of Gatic, which mm. until April, even despite the layers of obfuscation, the the flagging in a, a, a registry, and clearly being involved in in shipping sanctioned oil, it still retained its liability protection and liability coverage until there was so much press scrutiny 
that the the club involved removed coverage there. Yeah, and I mean, you, you said it, it; it's an accident waiting to happen, and you, you showed the mm. pictures of the, of the Pablo there, and I, the the amount of ship to ship transfers you showed going on all over the place. I mean, the, even just the risk of a of an oil spill, let alone um, an explosion. Exactly. If if that happens, I mean, the the chances of tracking someone down and holding them liable or or, or paying for it. Um, how remote is that? Pretty well, extremely hard. remote. And I I use the example of the the Pablo. Mm. The reason that this didn't get more extensive press attention was that the vessel was in ballast, which means that it wasn't carrying any oil. Mm -hmm. Now, had it been carrying oil, this would have been a disaster. That would have been about six hundred thousand barrels. Mm. But to this day, the Pablo accident it happened in April, and it remains where it happened because that nobody is prepared to send out a salvage crew because nobody knows who's going to pay for it. So it's it's unresolved. And a typical example of, of what will happen should there be an environmental spill, the, the country affected will be on the hook for, mm. for cleaning it up. Yeah, I'm not, not quite connected, but it occurs to me that there, there's a, a floating storage tanker somewhere off Yemen in the Red Sea that had not been maintained for years, and again, at, at yes. risk. Of, I, I was under the impression that the UN had sort of found funds or stepped in to do something. Do you know about that one? I, I don't know if that sort yes. of is relevant. Yes. Yes, well, that that's a very good example. Although I think the it wasn't so much the ownership; it, it had to do with the 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 from memory the the Yemen government. But because of the the lack of insurance, the IMO had to raise about twenty million dollars in order to get another vessel in order to unload the oil from there to avoid a, an environmental disaster. And I think that's starting next week. So mm. that's a disaster mm. averted. But that yes. very very easily could have been a, a major ecological disaster. Absolutely, yeah, and you hope it doesn't come to it. Um, I got another question. Um, is the Dark Fleet used for anything other than um, oil sanctions busting? I mean, it, for example, is it being used as, uh, I, I was thinking about what, what, where the workforce, the seafarers are from, it, it, is it also involved, for example, in people trafficking, or is it really just focused on oil sanctions busting, to your knowledge? No, it's, it's well it's I wouldn't say sanctions busting I'd say sanctions circumvention sanctions yeah. evasion in some cases and then of course you know when it comes to Venezuelan crude which is U.S. sanctioned um it, those sanction if you're if you're a African ship owner shipping to China technically as long as you don't go through the U.S. banking system and shipping is typically transacted in U.S. dollars. So that's very mm. difficult. Mm. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're breaking sanctions. So right. um, it, I think there's too much money to be made to, to focus on people trafficking or anything like that. I mean, for example, one Aframax cargo going from Primorsk to India, I think the, the going rate is about nine million pounds. And so the cargo, you know, is worth maybe well, I've can't calculate it off the top of my head, but it's a substantial amount of money to make for a vessel, a really old vessel that you've maybe bought for twenty-five million pounds several years ago. Yeah, and, and presumably the, the rates of scrapping have gone down, have they? Exactly. Yeah. No ships are, are scrapped. So, to to non-shipping people, a vessel will normally reach the end of its life at about 20 years of age, mm. typically because it costs so much to keep them running. And that's what is the, the fearful, what will make, makes me fearful of an environmental disaster is because not only are these old average age 23 years, but they're, they're having, there's no sort, sort of safety or technical oversight about the structural integrity of these ships. Mm. I'm, I'm also, I'm showing my age or the amount of time I've been out of the shipping industry, but mm. um, are, are all of these double hulled or, is, I mean, is, is that now the default that every tanker is double hulled? And, or, yes, yeah. Yeah. All, all the single hull ships have, have le I think they left the fleet the very latest at 2010. Mm. There you go, well, that, that dates me. <laughs> leaving shipping in 2009 yeah. but, it's, yeah. what a, but um the, the i mean it, i think what you're saying on if the russian sanctions were lifted um that the dark fleet's not going to go away because there's still iran or venezuela or other other sanctions to be circumvented 
Well, the, the point is, is that the imposition of Russian sanctions have doubled the, the dark fleet in about the last 18 months. So when I started tracking the dark fleet, which was when sanctions on Venezuela and Iran were first introduced about four or five years ago, um, there were very few of these vessels. Um, and, and this has emerged as a consequence. Started with Iran, I think China, China's Costco, which is the mm -hmm. government owned tanker arm of the of, of the, the the China fleet. They sent some of their really old clapped out VLCCs to do ship to ship transfers of Iranian oil in order to mm -hmm. um, circumvent the US sanctions. And they got busted and they got designated by UN authorities, which sent the freight price for tankers for a particular class of tankers very mm -hmm. high. And so after that, once the, the, the black ban was removed, then you saw the rise of anonymously owned tankers undergoing these trades. Now, in the case of Gatic that I mentioned earlier, somebody found $1.5 billion to amass a fleet of 50 tankers in less than a year. Where does that money come from? I mean, it's not coming from banks. They can't finance these vessels. So there has been speculation that Rosneft is ultimately behind some of these dark fleet vessels, but you, you could never prove it. it. It's not possible because of these regulatory crevices that have been used. Mm. And, I mean, does this issue get traction at, I don't know, for example, G20 level, or is it sort of happening more in the, the um, level of, industry experts or, or or regulators i mean how, how much political will is there to try and sort out the, the the transparency issues well i think i actually think there's not as much political will as you would expect like i always say if i know about these ships and i track them then of course the the united states government must know and mm. you know i've had interactions with them but it kind of serves their purpose to have oil flowing from these countries, because otherwise the oil price is going to rise and you'll see what happened with gas prices mm. back yep. um, at, up, upon the, the initial invasion of, of Ukraine with Russia when you had inflationary energy prices, particularly in Europe, and it triggered you know, a whole recalibration of those trades. Mm. Just, we, we've been talking about oil, but just when you're saying the, the Ukraine invasion, is, is any similar type of thing happening with um, grain grain ships exporting out of Ukraine or, or Russia, or is, is that not a similar issue? No. So there's a there's a Black Sea Grain Initiative that mm. has been started under the auspices of the IMO, which allows vessels to go to Ukraine and load grain and and it's mostly done for um, humanitarian purposes but it is actually commercially um, set up so that has been operating there there have been uh, there has been grain smuggling um, mm -hmm. using some of the same tactics it's not something that I'm across totally but mm -hmm. but yes the playbook is equally applicable for for bulk carriers mm -hmm. and as it is for tankers mm -hmm. okay um, on, I, mean, I don't know if there's a, a technical question, but I'm really interested in what you're saying about the spoofing and and AI. Mm. I mean, the AIS. I, is it as simple as anyone on the ship can choose to turn off the transponder if if they want? Yes, yeah. they they can. They do. Um, in terms of manipulating, there's a range of of ways to do this. Some ships uh, they simply just have two AIS transponders on on board, and they will turn one off or turn one on. Mm -hmm. We've seen um, vessel identity laundering, whereby a vessel will trick the IMO into issuing an IMO number, which it will then apply to another vessel. There's all sorts of shenanigans that have been used in order to um, avoid scrutiny. However, there are also other techniques like synthetic radio aperture and satellite images. So mm -hmm. often I will not see an STS via AIS, but I will receive a satellite image which proves that it's happened. Yeah, that's really because the the, the question from uh, one of our members, David Lamb, was 
um, would it be possible to, to jam the communications between the vessel and, and the people managing them? I mean, it, it's presumably not beyond the, the wit of government technology if they wanted to, if it's all going via satellite. Um, I, I guess it would be possible, um, but we're not we're not seeing that no. that level of, of intervention at all. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is mostly happening right under the noses of of regulators. And you know, international shipping is very, you know, it just happens. People don't really think too much about it. So it's um it, it it's an easy industry to to hide. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, and 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 the spoofing thing. Do, do you know how that works? So you you literally your your ships in you know off off West Africa, but it's showing that it's in the Mediterranean. Or I mean, it's. I don't have the. I, I mean, there are many technical ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you can use. I, I you know what well, I wouldn't be able to describe it completely. No, Let's just say it is. It is very sophisticated and. Yeah. When we look at the the readouts, it's obviously it happens on board. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just I mean, look at just from your perspective. I mean, as a journalist, how how do you go without diverging trade secrets? But I mean, how 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 challenging is it to, to to track all this? I mean, you can can as you say, you can see things through satellite vision that you don't pick up otherwise. Or I mean, fascinating to know how you go about tracking some of these ships or following or can you can you track a ship and see at what point it turns off its transponder and then when yes. it turns on again and figure out what's yes. gone in the interim yes well i mean that's why i developed the methodology because the ghost fleet shadow fleet dark fleet there's all sorts of names for it but mm. in order to measure it and we need in order to track it we need to measure it which is why yeah. i i sort of apply what it is so sometimes it's easy it's as easy as looking at flag registries and you know for example mongolia has seven tankers in its fleet that have transferred from gatic mm -hmm. dark fleet easily yeah. you know djibouti all of a sudden starts red starts flagging very large crude carriers and then you have a look at where the trades they're in very easy to track and in terms of communicating on trying to communicate with some of these these owners and operators um i've had legal threats mm. it's been it, it it's not easy and you know these are people that don't want to be found yeah absolutely and i i'm i think it it's um very chat i mean one comment it does come up another of our members margaret reese jones and a fascinating talk um and what a career investigative journalist loves the title too we we like the title oh, thank <laughs> you. Right. um i mean we we've covered a lot of technical ground i've got sort of maybe one last question to wrap up it's just i think you talked earlier about the greek fleet um mm -hmm. i think not being counted as part can you could you just elaborate on on that sure so part of the methodology is that these tankers have to be anonymously owned mm. and with the greek fleet of tankers we've tracked them back to their beneficial owners in greece so that's why they're excluded but um, Greek Greek tanker owners, uh, they're they're not risk averse, and there's lots of money to be made. They're private companies; they don't have to worry about being listed, and so they have all piled into this market, and they are making an absolute killing. Mm. They obviously they are compliant with the oil price cap. They have to be. Some of their tankers are flagged with Malta or Greece anyway, so those flag registries have to be compliant too. So. They are not part of the fleet for that reason, but but often they they feel that they are targeted because of the um, unwelcome publicity about these markets. And their argument is that we're not doing anything illegal, and if we don't do it, someone else will do it. There are some European ship owners who immediately, upon the invasion of Ukraine, said, "Right, we're out of this market as soon mm -hmm. as we can. Yeah. We can be." So there's been a very strict delineation in attitudes towards taking this business mm, okay well it, it's fascinating that's that's been a really um interesting sort of tour d'horizon of um well the shipping industry or the tanker industry and and dark fleet um i think i mean it, it, it we've covered an awful lot of detail and thank you for 
uh, not not burdening us with too much jargon. Uh, it was very well explained, Thank I you. think, to to a lay audience, um, but an interested and uh, savvy geopolitical uh, lay audience. So um, really, really fascinating. I'm just going to see if there's any. Um, Okay, I got one one final one. So just um, the the oil majors. Any any of the big oil companies involved in this and in, in oil out of it? No, no, not not at all. No. Their their hands are clean. I mean, these are you know this is the real underbelly of the oil trade. Mm. Um, a very very large section, very large underbelly. But um, no, most of the most of those companies, you know what the shipments are, and it's all sort of above above board and and transparent mm, excellent well i think that sort of pretty much it's not quite our full hour but we've covered so much ground um we, you've got a full day ahead of you so i should i have you go but uh, <laughs> uh, michelle on behalf of aia and our members and our audience um thank you very much for coming on and and enlightening us um thank you to the audience for your interest and questions and we we will continue to watch with interest um what happens with the dark fleet and hope for no uh, no accidents waiting to happen but uh, good great great job uh, please keep at it and uh, wonderful having you on so thanks very much michelle thank you very much for having me